from David Fletcher. You're a very talented man, Scott, and have, like myself, been pushed by necessity to learn new skills over the years, to earn a living and keep the wolves from the door. Is there anything which you draw the line at and would never try your hand at? What was your biggest fail, the one where you always wanted to go back in time to put right? Inside of the broad general category of construction and productivity that I would draw my that I draw the line at, wouldn't try my hand at. It would de depend on necessity, I guess. It would depend on if I had a choice. If the wolf was at the door hard enough and I just had to take it, I, I don't think there is anything that I wouldn't try, but there are some things that I don't like and there are some things that I'm just no good at. Um, I hate mechanic work. I hate working on cars and engines because it feels to me like trying to solve a puzzle without the key to the puzzle. And I, I like to improvise rather than sight read music. And I like to speak extemporaneously rather than reading. So I, I don't like mechanic work and I have good mechanic friends to cover that when I can afford it. I don't like electrical work and I'm no good at it. So I stay away from it and I'm lousy at taping and texture drywall, ta texturing drywall. So those are things that I'm no good at and I don't like, but I would do if I had to. But I okay, so I learned something interesting about myself about five years ago. And, and this relates to another question about subcontractors. I had a subcontractor, so let me speak to that for a second. We're going to have a video on picking good subcontractors because they are, uh, for a general contractor, your subcontractors are your primary asset. And they have to be on your team and not just a group of people that you drive. And there are ways that I, over the years, have sort of identified people that I could work with. And I made a mistake one time for about, well, for three or four years in using a particular subcontractor, a painter, that I was always uneasy. And he didn't fit in some of the criteria that I had sort of used for picking other subcontractors. And I had one particular job where, because of choices that the painter made, it cost me 15,000 bucks. That was a lot of money. It took the wind right out of my sails. It was, you know, that was a couple years profit, gone. An unhappy client that I had to give, give her money back in order to feel like I had done what I had to do. And it hurt me badly enough financially and in terms of um, my ambition and my energy and my desire to keep my morale, that I went out and started looking for a job. I talked to the people at Lowe's about what, what it would be like to work at Lowe's, behind the pro desk or somewhere. And then I was approached by some people, a big, a big business for a maintenance man position. And I filled out the paperwork. And I went to two interviews. And they offered me a job. And when I got right down to it, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. So I guess that's the answer to your question, is I have become so addicted to the freedom and creative outlet of being self-employed as a contractor that I guess I can't go back to work for somebody else. And then the last part, what was my biggest fail? The one where I always wanted to go back in time and put it right. Wow, I've got a great friend in Las Vegas, Warren Hafen, who along with his brothers has been very successful in big commercial construction in Vegas since I left there. Warren is a go-ahead guy, and when he and I were in our 20s in Las Vegas, a side job came up through an architect on a job that he was working on to put in a very elaborate fountain in the courtyard of a Catholic church. It was as choppy as concrete work can be. Sort of a, oh, I can't even describe it, I don't have pictures, but trust me when I tell you it was intensely angular and geometric and asymmetric and slopes and grades and it was four yards of concrete and I think I had I think I had around 300 hours building the forms okay and the architect specified 8,000 psi concrete 3 8 aggregate how do you do that how do you get 8,000 psi with 3 8 rock well the answer is it's almost not even concrete anymore there's additives and admixtures and glues and accelerants and who knows what it was it was a, a non-typical enough request that the batch plant sent all their technical people out to see what it looked like when it came out of the truck and how it went into the form. And we wheelbarrowed it back into this courtyard and it was an elaborate and it was put in place with a shovel, okay? 
It was a very sanitary environment and we vibrated it and we struck it and we vibrated it and we filled those forms up and we tapped them and we vibrated it and we had to pour it at low slump because we had to maintain the strength. And about three days later, we stripped those forms and that stuff was so sticky. It was so stiff and so sticky that in vibrating it, it would kind of pull the air out and the air would work its way over to the forms and the mud was so sticky, the air couldn't come up. And so the sides were a mass of hemispherical voids. Half a bubble, bam, plastered against the face of those forms everywhere. And then the back, the decoration on, the decoration on this was to be sandblasted. We were to sandblast this 8,000 PSI mix in this very elaborate piece of concrete work, a fountain with water and, uh, <laughs> So we mixed up, the, and it was colored, it was colored of course, and so we tried to match the color and we put in the aggregate and we put some bonder in there and we filled all those holes and we sacked it off and looked pretty good until we sandblasted it. And then the patch was so much softer than the parent stock that all the patches just blew out. And so when we were done, all the surfaces that had been tooled were perfect and all the surfaces that had been formed looked like they had smallpox and we had to walk away from it. And we always wanted to go back and tear that thing out and fix it. And the last time I was in Las Vegas, they had done that for us, only they didn't fix it, they just tore it out. And uh, it still hurts to recount that. Thanks for asking. Next question from Joshua Horn. Let me circle back to the last one. He says, could you give some advice from your experience on finding good subcontractors? Thanks for your work. That video is coming soon. I'll just tell you this, when you meet them, if you don't feel that they're someone that you could engage with as a friend, they're not your man. But I've got a lot more to say about that. So stand by, Josh. Larry Scarborough, really enjoy all the videos. How would you recommend sharpening a chainsaw chain on the job? With a chainsaw file on a stump, okay? I don't use any guides. The guides are great, I guess, but just give yourself the benefit of the doubt. Look at the angles and copy them. Practice, I'll demonstrate that in the video, but it's not rocket science. If they're not perfectly sharp, it's still gonna, get, it's still gonna cut, and the next time you file it, you're gonna pay closer attention, and you're gonna learn, and you're gonna watch YouTube videos at guys like me sharpening saws, and it, it'll be fine. But you don't need to be perfect, you just need a saw that's gonna cut. So anyhow, I sharpen them with a file on the job, no guide, no nothing, put a glove on, put a handle on if you want, we'll do a video. Hugh O'Brien, I am concerned about fencing around the project. Yikes, we are too, and we're going to address it. So good question. We've constructed a cliff, and we'll have to protect people from it. So great question. Foster Gwynn, what does your wife think about having a workaholic husband, and does, did she have any input on the spec house? Okay, am I a workaholic? Not compared to my wife. She just leaves a cloud of dust everywhere she goes. So Kelly's input to this, on the spec house is from time to time, and it comes more as warnings. Hey, I don't think that's gonna work. And as often as not, she's right. Having a workaholic husband. You, your impression is not quite accurate because so much of the time you're watching me in a speeded up mode. I don't move around like that. I'm old, I'm 60. I move at a much more sedate pace. I guess I have been a workaholic. That was driven by four children, a single blue collar income for most of our lives, a wolf always sitting, panting and growling on the doorstep. So yeah, am I a workaholic? Yeah, maybe, but I just like to be productive and my wife supports it completely. From Stephen Nusser, what tool do you use only rarely, but is essential to have for those once in a blue moon situations? Thanks for asking that question, I hadn't really I, I'd never framed that question. And as soon as I read it, I thought of two. So I hope two is, a, is an agreeable answer. And one of them I've shown you before on my top 10 tools video, but it's my wood slick. When, I, when Wadco construction was still functioning, I would use it once a year, twice a year, once every two years, occasionally. But sometimes it was the only tool that would work. But the one that I use less than that, and when I need it, it is, vital is this Veritas transfer scribe. I think I've owned it for 20 years. 
I think I've used it three times. And each time, it was very clear to me that there was nothing else that would do it. It's for transferring an irregular profile onto another piece. And you can work in any axis. It has two vials, so you can remain in a uniform plane level in both directions, although one of the vials has lost its fluid. The other was fine. So you can remain constant and transfer a profile. Think of log construction or scribing a board to a large stones or something. So anyhow, those are the two tools that are a once in a blue moon thing, but nothing else, nothing else will suffice when you need them. Great question. From Matt Dobilis. Dobilis? Matt. What advice would you go back and give yourself when you were just starting out? I don't know how old you are, Matt. I'm going to assume that you're a youngish man. I spent two terms at Oregon State University. Um, I think I would have stayed there longer. I was distracted by music. I was playing with a jazz band and touring the country and recording albums and I thought I was going to be a star. And uh, so I probably would have talked myself into getting some more education. But I think closely related to that, I would have advised myself to be a little more patient and not, not try to move too fast and not to make some decisions too quickly, I think. I've used a Franklin planner for years, and one of the things that I really like about a Franklin planner now is they have little quotations and aphorisms and proverbs each day. And one of them has stuck, several of them have stuck in my mind, but one of them is that life is what happens while you're making other plans. I probably would have tried to explain that to my younger self, that, yeah, Wadsworth, you're planning this, and you think that's going to happen, but something else is going to happen, and it's going to be great. And just be patient, because odds are it's going to be better than the thing you thought you wanted. I probably would have given myself the advice to have a couple more kids. I had four. They're awesome. Right now, I wish I had a couple more. Anyway, I guess that would have been plenty of advice, and I wouldn't have listened to it anyway, would I? That would be the last thing. Would be when somebody, Wadsworth, older than you, tells you something and it feels important, listen to it and change your course to accommodate it. Kevin Taylor. Hello guys, keep up the good work. I'm soon to embark on a treehouse project, design yet to be finalized, and would like to buy a welder for making up mild steel. I assume he meant welding up mild steel, making up mild steel, uh, holding brackets and lugs for attaching cables to, etc. Can you advise me on the best kind of first welder to look at buying? Most of the work would could be done inside, though the option to tack weld outside would be attractive. I'm thinking. Budget, not open-ended, but happy to spend what is required for a piece of kit that works well and lasts well over time. Hope you can find time to give some feedback on this. It would be much appreciated. All the best with everything, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Buy a stick welder. Buy a... Um, I like a Lincoln. I like a Lincoln buzz box. They're not expensive. AC and DC. So you can burn 6011 and 7018. 6011 or 6010 is a good tacking rod. 7018 runs in all positions. It's strong. It's very friendly. It's almost a drag rod. That is, you can almost just keep the edge of the flux in contact with your metal. And as that burns away, know you've got the right arc length. If you want to go with a MIG gun, you don't want to go with a MIG gun. You need to have a stick machine to start. You can weld outside, you can weld overhead. You just have to figure out how to get your electricity out there. Make up a big, stout 10-gauge extension cord that matches the plug-in on a dryer outlet or a range outlet and that matches the plug-in on your welder. Can't be too long, but if you can reach your treehouse with that, you're in business. And by the way, we're going to be building a treehouse too pretty soon, and the design is not finalized yet, but I'd be anxious for any pictures that you might have of how your project goes. So the takeaway is, I'd get on Craigslist. I'd look for a used Lincoln buzz box, ACDC. When you, go to, when you go to buy it, plug it in, take a rod. If it strikes an arc, buy it. Can't go wrong. Tim Boggs, what is your motivation to work hard and do good work? Is there a driving motivation that holds you accountable to do quality work and treat your customers well? 
that's a big question. And I, so I'm going to take a chance here and I'm going to claim that Thales of Mileta and Confucius, who were both, who were peers, they lived about the same time, I think about 600 BC, are among the first to have espoused what came to be known as the silver rule, which is do not unto others what you would not have others do unto you. Okay, now that's, that's good advice. But that's not quite the same as being driven to do quality work for people, is it? The golden rule drives me to try harder, and that is do unto others as you would have others do unto you. There's a world of satisfaction in that. There's a world of peace. There's a world of fulfillment. There's a world of um, a better way to go. Just thinking about that a little more often. It has helped me as a contractor to realize, wait a minute, I, I think I would like it like this. They're probably about like I am. I'm going to do it like that. And then if your relationship is such or your agreement was such that you felt you could go to them and say, you know, I went a little past. Do you feel like coughing up something? I mean, if, assuming I didn't take care of a change order on the front. Maybe you do that, maybe you don't. But if your default position is treating other people just exactly the way you would hope to be treated, were you they and were they you, huh, it'll drive you to do good work. And I'm thankful for that.